Hi, and welcome back to part two of our training. So we are going to dive into um, some of the blogs and articles and videos that I've been watching to help me deepen my understanding. And hopefully some of them will resonate with you as articles or videos that you would like to watch and dive into. Um, as I was scrolling through a lot of the um, social media and people that I follow, um, educators of color and um, experts in the field, I came across um, this article on a news site that focuses on um, inequity in education. And the title of the article really grabbed my attention. A call to action, black educators need white co-conspirators to combat racism in schools and empower our students to succeed. And in that article, they quoted Dr. Bettina Love. And so I followed the links to Dr. Bettina Love's article, an essay for teachers who understand racism is real. And really found a lot of those concepts to help me understand better um, what my role might be in supporting um, the anti-racism movement. And I wanted just to kind of read through with you these three paragraphs that really resonated with me. So in the interview, Dr. Bettina Love, who is the author of We Want to Do More Than Survive, spoke of the role of a co-conspirator as originally defined by community organizer groups. A co-conspirator says, I know the terms. I know what white privilege and white supremacy mean. Now, what risks am I willing to take? You know, what is, am I willing to do to put my privilege on the line for somebody? In essence, white education co-conspirators must be unapologetically anti-racist, committed to listening and learning, willing to cede power while using privilege to invite others to lead, uncompromising in providing high quality education for black children and prepared to take political risks to advance their needs. And here is the key. The work must be done in full and equitable partnership with black leaders if we are to shape the pillars of an education institution that values and celebrates black students. So much about this article resonated with me and I really paused um, for two or three days to unpack everything that the article was sharing. And um, one of the key thoughts that kept resonating with me is that, you know, I as a white educator, as a co-conspirator, need to be working in equitable partnership with black leaders. And one of the ways that I thought of first was, you know, I spend a lot of time already on social media, but am I following the right people? Am I following black leaders? Am I following um, thinking partners? Um, who are people of color that can help me reframe my mindset. And when I went through my Instagram and my Twitter and my Facebook, uh, my answer was no, I was not doing a good job of that. Um, my Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter were very white. And so I really worked to reshape that and um, found many black leaders, uh, black educators, um, social leaders, politicians, and community leaders, and reframed my Twitter so that now my feed is much more equitable and I'm getting a clearer view of what's actually happening in the world. I changed my Instagram following very much so that I am following um, black hip hop artists and um, black poets and authors so that I could hear their thoughts and learn from them. Um, and I found my world to be all the better for it and really sad with myself that I had not done that until today. Uh, today being uh, several months ago, but nonetheless, I've really changed um, how I'm thinking and learning. So I would encourage you um, to take some time, read these two articles. Neither of them are long, but as I said, uh, they were weighty for me. And think through your world 
and how you can kind of reshape your learning. Um, in our last video, we kind of talked about that concept of lots of us are doing book studies and uh, changing, you know, looking at our classroom library and buying new books, and we should do all of those things. Um, but those are fixed solutions often. We do them once and we're done. So if we change who we follow on social media, or we change how our news feeds come in, change some of the parameters for our search engines, um, then we can really have a more equitable worldview. And I really focused on doing that because those are things I do every day um, so that my daily mindset is changing um, and not just when I read a new book and then maybe forget about that over time. I was really frustrated with myself that we had read the opportunity myth when it first came out, um, but it was kind of a one-time read. I pulled a few quotes and put them in a slide, but it disappeared from my mind memory. And so I'm hoping by making changes to my social media feeds that I read often daily that I can change my mindset long term. In the first video, we talked a little bit about the preschool study. And we do know that our implicit bias definitely can affect students, um, even as early as preschool, knowing that teachers were watching students of color more often, but did not identify or think that they were doing that. Um, this um, screenshot is from the opportunity myth um, that reminds us that success rates on grade level work um, were similar in that students of color often did not get the opportunity to even try grade level work. I'll say that again. Students of color were often not given the opportunity to try grade level work. If you look at the quote in the middle, Four out of 10 classrooms with a majority of students of color never received a single grade level assignment. When they were given grade level content, success rates on all grade level assignments from classrooms with mostly students of color were at 56%. Success rates on all grade level assignments from classrooms with mostly white students were at 65%. So similar, but if four out of those 10 classrooms never received that opportunity, 38% of classrooms that had no grade level assignments in classrooms with mostly students of color, that number just blows me away. How many of you have paused to think through what does my assignment, what do my assignments look like? Do my assignments, uh, are they on grade level? Am I expecting that content mastery of my students? Or is there a reason I'm not offering that? And then think through how we can make that change for our students. When I was on my personal learning journey, um, one of the first places I went to explore was TED Talks because I often find that the way the content is presented there um, is something that I can relate to. And so I saw this image and was just very taken aback and watched the TED Talk and learned so much. And so I'm very thankful. Paul Rucker shared this in 2018. And he talks about the symbols of systemic racism and how to take away their power. When I saw this image, I thought, oh, I can never show images of, of this kind of racism in a classroom. But he talks about how we can and should teach a history appropriately and how we need to understand history. So taking that opportunity to listen to Paul Rucker's lived experience um, was a powerful moment for me. Um, if this TED Talk is not something that uh, you feel like you're ready to access, I would definitely encourage you to check out some of the other TED Talks that are offered. Um, through Paul's work and the work of others, we are definitely being called as educators to the concept of co-conspiracy, which was a new term for me. 
in developing an anti-racist mindset and actions. And I've really been processing, what does that mean? This call for representation that goes beyond conversations about slavery and about voting, but making sure that my representation across all of my content um, is culturally responsive and engages all students. So how can I do that, right? How can we have daily inclusion for our students of color and our black students in our curriculum? How can we make sure that our content is positive and proactive? How can we ensure that every student of color, every student who is black can see themselves positively reflective in the narratives that are school and community? This to me is our call to action. So I'd love for you to take a few minutes and plan your next steps, thinking through these quotes for this daily inclusion. What could you do differently? You know, what have you already done that is successful? But what can you do differently in the future? And what changes are you planning to make? In order for us to be able to make appropriate changes, there were a few key terms that I really had to wrap my head around to make sure that I understood the language and the terms that were being used and to check my own mindset, my own privilege, my own bias um, to see where I stand. So we're going to look deeply into these concepts of cultural bias and cultural humility, implicit bias and microaggressions, and culturally appropriate language. What should we be able to know and understand and change in our thinking? It's a good idea if you have this slide deck printed out. I would go ahead and rate your current knowledge on a zero being, I haven't even heard that term, to a five being, yeah, I've taken a lot of training on this and I feel like I've totally got this concept. When I was originally doing this learning, cultural humility was a brand new term for me. I would definitely have rated that as a zero. I hadn't even heard of it. Or cultural bias, I felt like I've heard that term a lot. I don't know that I could define it for someone else, but I feel like intrinsically I understand it right? And microaggressions, I could not have given you a definition for that prior to this training. So think through your own personal lens and where you stand and kind of rate your current learning. In my research to try and really understand these concepts, I came across quite a few good um, videos and articles on microaggressions and the three basic types of microaggressions. So let's just take a few minutes to dive into those. The first one, if we're dividing this term microaggressions up into micro invalidations, those are communications that negate or nullify or exclude the feelings or experiences of a person of color. So for example, if I would ask a person of color, where were you born? Implying that they are foreigners in their own hometown. And they look at me and say, I was born in Newport, Kentucky, or I was born in you know, Boone County. A micro assault is a conscious and intentional action or words that deliberately demean a person of another race. So displaying flags, displaying symbols that are created to intimidate, um, serving a white student before a student of color would be an example of a micro assault. And then a micro insult is a verbal or nonverbal communications that are just rude and insensitive or demean a person's racial heritage or identity. So for example, asking a person of color how he got a job with the implication being that they're part of a quota system. We know that microaggressions matter even if they were not ill-intentioned, even if it was just someone saying things, something they did not think about, they did not understand the implications of what they were saying, or they absolutely meant it to be an insult. Whatever, whatever the reason, the words that are said are the words that are said. And so microaggressions definitely um, are part of what has happened um, in our American culture and something that we now can be aware of and can make a change to our language. So let's pause for a moment as we're going to continue to do. Given the definitions of micro invalidations, micro assaults, and micro insults, 
I would encourage you to think through times when you have heard those being used and consider what those look like. If you have not had a lot of experience in looking deeply into that, the Atlantic article has lots of examples. And if you click on um, this BuzzFeed um, hyperlink, it will take you to a video where you can see a lot of those microaggressions. So let's take it to the next level. Now that we kind of understand microaggressions and all of their pieces, we also definitely need to understand the background of trauma and how that is part of the experience for Black people and people of color. Um, as ASCD has said in one of their blog articles, if we aren't addressing racism, we aren't addressing trauma. We know that um, trauma is a toxic impact to our students. It can affect their mental and their physical health and definitely racial trauma work is necessary. It's also necessary for white children because we know that there's something behind those, uh, those racist actions, right? So we need to make sure that all students understand the damage of um, racist thoughts and beliefs and actions. If we think about the Central Park dog walker, Amy Cooper, or other civil rights injustices, um, black people being killed in the streets, uh, that causes trauma, trauma to all. And we need to make sure that we are understanding that. And while I say that causes trauma to all, you know, I, I will say that you know, every time um, any footage comes on of George, of George Floyd and his death, I feel that deeply, but as deeply as I resonate with that, you know, as, as a mother, as a woman, um, as a teacher, um, I don't have the same fear that that might happen to me or to my child um, as, as a, a black parent might have or a black educator might have. So while we all understand that there is some traumatic um, feelings and some trauma stress, and we need to also appropriately place ourselves in where that trauma impacts us. There are some excellent resources on trauma and anti-racism that focus on that culturally responsive teaching lens. Um, ASCD has some great articles on culturally responsive teaching. I've linked you into all of those articles. And the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, who has done phenomenal work around um, trauma and its impact on our students, has a new resource called Addressing Race and Trauma in the Classroom. All of these resources are free and we can download those to use in our classroom. We're really focusing on um, not stopping at a trauma-informed approach where we're asking students not what is wrong with them, but what's happened to you. And we're moving to that healing-centered approach of what's strong with you, what, what is great with you. If you are not familiar with trauma-informed care, and this is a new concept for you, on our NKCES website, we have three trauma-informed care trainings, starting with an overview, um, a second training focusing on strategies, and a third training and that really focuses on applying what you've learned in trainings one and two. Those trainings focus specifically on trauma-informed care. We know when we're looking at culturally responsive teaching, we want to take it to that next level and look at a healing center approach. We also want to make sure that we are consistently checking with experts in the field and um, really following those people on social media and checking their websites often. There is a website I just became aware of called the BIPOC Project that is for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color movement. And I love the quote they have on their first part of their website. It is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. Um, I went ahead and created for myself a really quick visual with those words. How can I recognize? How can I accept? And how can I celebrate differences that come in my classrooms when I have Black, Indigenous, and people of color in my classroom? 
This is a wonderful opportunity for us to stop and to reflect on our personal lens. Um, Castle, and for those of you that aren't familiar with Castle, Castle does a lot of social emotional learning resources, and they have done a lot of reflection as an organization um, in response to everything that is happening across our nation, and they are really looking at equity and trauma and anti-racism. And so they've included on their website um, links to work created by the National Equity Pro Project. I love this resource on the left, Social Emotional Learning and Equity Pitfalls and Recommendations. They give us pitfalls and then recommendations. So um, some of the pitfalls might be like number one, where we as educators misunderstand the purpose of social emotional learning for students of color. And we're looking at it from a deficit mindset. Oh, they don't have this skill. They don't have that skill. Um, instead, we should be focusing on the skills that our students do have. I love the recommendations that we want to lead and teach with the understanding that all learning is social and emotional for our students and that we change our lens to situate any initiative or effort or program that we consider for our classroom in the historical, socio-political, and racialized context of education. We really want to think through our students' lived experiences. I've linked this resource in so that you can download it for yourself and really go through. I took it and highlighted those key phrases in areas where I thought, wow, this is something that I really need to consider a change. On the right hand side, if you have not had a chance yet to listen to Dina Simmons, she has some phen phenomenal information and insights for us into thinking through our students' context. Because often with social emotional learning and instruction, um, if we don't have context to our students' background, then what we're trying to teach can uh, be misguided at, at, at least and uh, damaging to our students at worst. So we want to make sure we're considering that lens. When we think about the culturally responsive teaching lens, for those of you that are newer to that concept, I've pulled in some graphics that to me did a great job of kind of wrapping up what is culturally responsive teaching. And definitely, if you look at the graphic on the left, um, a lot of this is about those visual representations, right? Are the posters on the walls representing all students? What about the books in the classroom? What about student work that's being displayed on the walls? Um, what about the language and content of our learning targets? What about the vocabulary that we're using? Are we supporting native language speakers and their vocabulary acquisition? Are we including our students' families and the resources? Thinking through culturally responsive teaching, it's, rep it's making sure we're acknowledging not only every student that is in our classroom, but I like to think of it as every student who might enter our classrooms. If we have to change everything about our classroom when we get a new learner, then we probably were off target to begin with. On the right, um, we've got a graphic for eight competencies for culturally responsive teaching, and I thought this was a good, quick model, where when we're thinking about culturally responsive teaching, if we kind of start on um, the top left, we want to reflect on our own cultural lens and recognize any bias that we might have and make sure we're redressing that making sure we're drawing on our students' culture to shape our curriculum and instruction. And again, like I said, not just the students that are currently in my classroom, but any student who might come. Um, do I have real world issues in my classroom? Am I modeling high expectations for all students? Making sure that I am not one of those one, four out of 10 classrooms that is not teaching grade level content. Am I promoting respect for my students and all of their differences? And if I'm thinking of them from a lens of differences as opposed to disabilities or a deficit mindset, I am on my way. Am I collaborating with families and my local community? For those of us who have local communities who are also very white, then am I pulling in the broader community to represent um, a culturally diverse uh, group.
and am I communicating in linguistically and culturally responsive ways? So two great lenses with which we might consider um, that culturally responsive teaching. In the first video, we looked at Jennifer Gonzalez and one of the articles that she shared with Sheldon Eakes. And um, here we've got a, another great visual for ways that we as educators can take action in pursuit of equity, part of our culturally responsive lens. So whether we're looking at challenging what they call the normalization of failure, um, I often look at this too as not placing the blame on the student, but taking ownership as an educator um, for how I taught the lesson. Am I speaking up for equity for all students, um, regardless of their um, race, their gender, their um, ability, or their uh, diagnosis? Am I embracing all students and their culture or potential culture? Um, and by potential culture, again, I'm referring to, um, I would teach my classroom every day as if I might have students come in from all across the world at any moment and my classroom is ready to receive them as learners. Am I providing everyone with clear guidance on what it takes to succeed and are my success criteria based on grade level standards? Am I building partnerships with families Am I aligning my um, positive and proactive classroom management? Here they say discipline practices to my classroom. Do I have plans for instead of remediation, but my focus is on um, supporting acceleration and access? Am I definitely focused on those evidence-based practices? And um, we've talked about building partnerships here for shared interests and here to develop student needs. And the last one, one of my favorites, teach the way students learn rather than expecting them to learn the way we teach. So am I pulling in, I said uh, at the beginning, I'm following on Instagram poets and actors and actresses and um, authors. Why am I following these people? Um, because these are who my students um, would be following and would know about. And I want to make sure I know about them too and can discuss that in class. I've got just several graphics here. Hopefully you find one that speaks to you the best about how we can look at culturally responsive teaching. Eastern Oregon University shared this graphic, um, which has some great implications for what they put into five big pillars, identity and achievement, equity and excellence, developmental appropriateness, teaching the whole child, and student-teacher relationships. If I got to change the world, I think I would redesign this based on current research and put student-teacher relationships at the beginning of this graphic because we know that research is telling us that's the most important starting point is to have those powerful and positive relationships. If you are looking for some great blogs and articles and resources to build a culturally responsive classroom, I've linked in several here um, that would give you some teaching strategies and ideas you can start your thinking. Um, including another article by Jennifer Gonzalez. The Kennedy Krieger Institute has a great digital resource roundup on culturally responsive teaching. And um, from that, there's also some great tools. If you've not read the book, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain, um, that is a super <laughs> um, leading resource um, in our world. And um, this article I've hyperlinked in here, um, Four Tools for Interrupting Implicit Bias, um, is a great way to deepen your learning. All right, we've looked at a bunch of resources and gone really quickly. So I'd like for you again to take a few minutes, um, grab your guided notes and think through what are you going to do differently and what changes are you making? We will dive into a few more TED Talks for our third video.